Just to orient ourselves, we are in laying foundations for adaptation priority area one where it is uh, necessary to lay the foundations for adaptation by helping people and firms and we are looking at action items under those we looked at action items one and two here we'll look at few more before we go to the next priority area under laying foundations for adaptation action 1.3 i will read as much text as necessary there is a lot of text uh, social science adaptation is a social science and in social science in general the problem statements and the solutions tend to be uh, kind of descriptive sometimes they become discursive so it's necessary to read a lot of text and understand the concepts it's not always full of equations like we have in dynamics courses and so on okay so keeping that in mind action 1.3 for facilitating people and firms to uh, adapt facilitate access to technologies through trade policies and investments in research and development these sound obvious and yet they need to be codified in terms of how the information is made available to people and firms to stay ahead of the climate risks effective adaptation will depend on countries being able to draw on the best available technologies for mitigating climate change impacts especially in the agriculture and health sectors food security and health security are critical of course and climate is heavily impacting both and we need to be able to adapt to those even as we try to mitigate the emissions and climate risks themselves but there are many obstacles from traditional knowledge spillover and lack of capacity to trade barriers that impair access and adoption of technology. So socio-technical transformations are not always straightforward. Just because the technology is available that could reduce your uh, agricultural risks or health impacts doesn't mean it will immediately be assimilated or adopted by uh, societies. International patent registration show that innovation in adaptation is not growing as a share of total innovation and is concentrated in high income countries and a handful of middle income countries transfers of this innovation are also insufficient with almost no transfers to low income countries where needs are likely the largest this suggests the need for countries to support all types of innovation from high tech solutions to institutional and process based innovations with a focus on local needs and to facilitate technology transfers with appropriate regulations, trade policies, and capacity building investments. Pandemic COVID, which we will look at throughout this uh, course, gives us a good example of what happens if you don't transfer technology to all. Pandemic spread throughout the world killed by some estimates upwards of 15 million people. And vaccines came along from several sources. There were uh, issues of whether they will be given away to poor countries and uh, not and who made the profit etc and which were more uh, effective vaccines and which were not etc but in the end it's clear that unless everybody is protected everybody is vulnerable so just because you took a vaccine uh, you don't become completely immune you are still open to infection even though you may not get sick and if there are unvaccinated people then the virus keeps circulating and evolving so new variants may come along and infect you again like the flu vaccine does every year the flu vaccine is a new variant and so on and this flu is in fact a remnant from the 1918 spanish flu so you can imagine that these things become very critical to protect everybody uh, action 1.4 ensure financing is available to all and provide direct support to the poorest and most vulnerable people high upfront costs or affordability issues may stop private actors from implementing effective solutions even if these costs are more than compensated uh, in the uh, long term by avoided impacts and losses the lack of financing can be a serious obstacle for credit constrained firms and households and in the absence of external support hundreds of millions of people in or close to poverty will be impacted by climate change and have limited ability to respond and adapt direct support through social protection or subsidies for resilience building interventions can play a key role in reducing their vulnerability so look in toolbox b later on uh, 
in the main text pre reviews uh, of methodologies to identify the most at risk populations due to the combination of poverty and vulnerability okay this is true for agriculture as well as health which is what we are focusing on here action 1.5 facilitate structural change in the economic system not easy but this is part of the adaptation strategy uh, that needs to be built in by principle climate change will affect latent comparative advantage for example it'll make some countries less productive in certain types of agriculture to the benefits of other to the benefit of others it will also cause the decline of some sectors and the growth of others. Governments need to manage and facilitate economic transition, deal with coordination issues and ensure social consequences ensure that social consequences are minimized. In practice, however, the risk is that an important sunset sector, one that is bound to lose competitiveness in coming years and decades, becomes non-profitable exactly when the country needs to be making large investments to boost another sector. So you hope the transition is such that one sector will be in uh, play and functional and effective while you are developing another sector but if it fails before that or has a uh, loss of competitiveness before the new sector is up and ready to take over the responsibilities then it's obviously going to be a problem so adaptation has to worry about that experience from regions where coal mining or heavy industries disappeared in europe shows how difficult it is to manage a successful transition especially when a region has a narrow economic base is isolated geographically and has a population with limited skills and investment capacity. Governments have various options for addressing this situation, so we'll look at some principles there. Support sunrise sectors and activities to maximize their development potential. So if you want to phase out coal or fa uh, coal power plants become economically uncompetent, incompetent, in Incompeta uncompetitive economically then you need to have renewables solar hydro uh, whatever in place already to take the position or fill the electricity demand that was being met by the coal power plants support sunrise sectors and activities to maximize their development potential so climate change may create new Comparative advantage in some countries and those where key sectors will be negatively affected must prepare to capture the opportunities climate change creates. However, if these comparative advantages face obstacles such as high upfront capital investment, uh, investments, increasing returns to scale and network effects, then a country may struggle to turn such latent advantages into growth and economic opportunities. Several studies offer guidance on how industrial policies can transform latent comparative advantages into real economic opportunities, especially if countries face the risk of low productive tra productivity traps. So if you have a region which has high wind energy potential or solar energy potential, and this is an advantage you have in terms of transitioning from coal to renewables, but you don't have skilled labor or uh, finance for investing in solar and wind or you don't have trained people to set up the f wind farms, solar farms etc or the grid to transmit the energy and so on then you need to worry about those things ahead of time before coal becomes uh, you know unviable manage sunset sectors and activities to facilitate a smooth transition some economic sectors may be strongly affected by climate change with significant implications for jobs and tax revenues for example some agricultural production may become non-competitive or unsustainable. Snow-based tourism may disappear from low-latitude mountains and summer destinations may become too hot to attract tourists. Targeted policies can help declining industries better manage the drop in activity, for example, by ensuring the least productive firms close first. This may be costly, but it can be justified by distributional considerations or the desire to smooth a transition. Right. So if you I was in Goa, India a couple of weeks ago, it's very, very hot and you barely see any tourists around and this will get worse with global warming and heat waves. So how Goa manages this uh, 
change in tourism season or tourism footfall is going to be critical. Support economic diversification to hedge against climate risks. Diversifying away from narrow economic bases is key to reducing vulnerability to climate change and other technological or preference shocks, including those caused by decarbonizing the world economy. But it's also desirable for governments to diversify their economy to accelerate econo economic growth. There is, of course, the more fundamental question of whether economic growth can be accomplished without uh, adding more to greenhouse gas emissions at all. But keeping that aside, economic diversification itself is needed to hedge against climate risks. So obviously, some sort of a life cycle analysis is necessary to make sure that economic diversification and uh, the focus on economic growth doesn't increase your climate risk itself. Okay, so we'll come back and look at priority area two, which is on adapting land use plans and protecting critical public assets and services, which is still under laying foundations for adaptation. Okay, so let's do that in the next podcast. <laughs>